the development of samadhi, which is the mind that is firm and stable, even though it can be very difficult and arduous, it's something that we should put great effort into training ourselves in. It's the beginning, it's normal for there to be these, these uh, difficulties. But if we want for there to just be results, it, it doesn't happen like that. It doesn't mean that we just get the results that we want. But as we practice, then we'll see that what we do gain is a sense of happiness. But we have to put an effort and really try in order to get those results. The Buddha said that we free, we free ourselves from suffering through effort. But even though we have this effort, if we just want the mind to be pure, that isn't going to make the mind pure. Because the state of our mind is that they're full of these defilements. They're packed full of greed, hatred, and illusion. And so we need to train ourselves in developing this meditation and to know the good thoughts when they arise and also to know the bad thoughts when they arise, that we have both of these things. But if we just want for there to be good thoughts and we don't want any thoughts to come up, then that'll create a lot of difficulty for us. And so we just know them as they come up. That desire to just be freed from these bad thoughts when they come up and not to want any bad thoughts to arise, that's one kind of suffering. So whenever any thoughts come up in the mind, then we just know them for what they are. We know that they have arisen, and then we put effort into abandoning them. We abandon any unwholesome thinking, and we don't allow ourselves to follow that and to act upon it. Any unwholesome thoughts, any bad thoughts, then when they come up, we don't follow them, and we try to abandon them. And we try to not... Uh, allow any unarisen, unwholesome states to arise. If we don't follow them once they've arisen, then even though they're there, they can't actually do any harm to us. And it's just like a tiger that's kept in a cage. If we don't give it any food, then it'll get very hungry, and it'll just be out of energy and tired and weak just by itself. So when we have mindfulness here, looking into our minds, knowing what thoughts come up, then this is the correct way of practice. And we try and do that a lot because it's natural for there to be many thoughts coming up in our minds. So we just know them. We have our mindfulness there, keeping up to pace with those thoughts. If there are any skillful thoughts, then we can follow those, that's okay. And if there are any unskillful thoughts, then we try to abandon them. And this is the kind of effort that we put into the practice. We try to give rise to any skillful states that haven't arisen yet. And so this kusala, uh, another way we could describe it is intelligence. So when we're able to bring the mind into a state of collectedness, of concentration, samadhi, this is a very high level of kusala, of skillfulness. But it's not that, sorry, some, some for, forms of merit, we're not able to do them every day. But we can remember the merit that we've done every day we can bring that up as a recollection. And we can also recollect our morality. We can recollect the, the precepts that we're keeping, 
whether they're the five precepts or the eight precepts. And doing this as a way of increasing the mind's skillfulness and uh, goodness. We can think about the Buddha, the Dharma and the Sangha, or we can recollect the Devas and their goodness, that they have these qualities of uh, shame of wrongdoing and a fear of wrongdoing. Hiri Otapa. And this will bring the mind to a state of, of joyfulness. And also make uh, developing samadhi and bringing the mind into a state of kanaka samadhi or momentary or small amount of samadhi. It will be easier to do that. So when we recollect things in this way, then our minds will be able to gather together into samadhi. And we should try to, to do this very often as much as we can. And so bringing the mind into momentary concentration is a form of skillfulness. Even though it's a small amount of samadhi, it's still very skillful and something that we should pursue often. Because when the mind is in a wholesome state, then unwholesome things aren't able to arise in it. So when we abandon unskillful things, bad things, we try to develop good things, then this shows that our mind has energy and is putting forth effort. And this is the goodness that we create through wisdom. When we have the mind in this state, then we can bring it to contemplate and to become familiar with the truth, to see that all sankharas, all conditioned phenomena, arise, stay for a while, and cease, and that's just their nature to be that way. We can contemplate into the body and perceive the body in clear light and see very clearly that it's not me, it's not mine, it's not self. And so the restraint of the heart is very important. Whether we're standing, we're sitting, we're walking, we're lying down, we should constantly try to restrain ourselves and collect ourselves in. We can, we can do this very often. It's something that we should do very often because if we don't, then it's natural for our mind to get sent outwards. With that lack of restraint, the mind goes out and it, it goes and sees many things and gets involved in many things, which in turn gives rise to feelings of pleasure or displeasure, liking or disliking. So we should try and collect the mind in. And this collecting of the mind is the training of samadhi. The monks have a very good opportunity to practice restraint very often, but it's not that lay people don't have an opportunity either. Lay people still have the time to do this as well. You can practice this by reciting the meditation mantra of Buddha or Dhammo or Sangho. And this is the way that we take up cultivating our minds. When our minds are brought to a state of stillness and peace, then we'll be able to see their original nature, the nature of brightness and of clarity. We'll know the nature of physicality and of mentality. And this is the practice of vipassana, the practice that will make the mind pure. And it's a great form of skillfulness and a great form of merit, this vipassana or insight. And so we follow our minds and we know what they're doing. And this following of the mind is the practice of insight as well. We know what we're thinking as it occurs, whether they're good thoughts or they're bad thoughts, we know that whether there's greed, hatred, and delusion present in the mind, or whether the mind is freed of greed, hatred, and delusion. We know that, and we don't allow ourselves to attach to it. And so 
a teaching that Ajahn Chah gave very frequently was that with anything that arises in the mind, just tell yourself that it's not sure, it's not permanent, it's not sure. Whether we like something, even if we are fascinated by it, it's not sure. It's very easy to see this teaching of uncertainty, of things being not sure these days, because there's a lot of change that's going on in the world. We can see just how uncertain the world is now. Nature by itself is pure, but when humans come and get involved and overuse uh, natural resources, then the world starts to degenerate and decay. But we can see that when humans just stop using these resources or use less of them, even for a short while, then nature returns to its original state of purity. And so it is with our minds. If our minds are constantly chasing after our moods and emotions, always running after them, then we won't be able to see our original pure nature. But when our mind ceases chasing after these, then we can see into our original nature, this nature of stillness. So for all of us practicing, we should really try to bring the mind to stillness and to peace. And then we'll be able to see for ourselves our original nature, the mind that is bright and is clear. So we know things as they're happening. We try and be aware and, and keep that awareness up to pace with everything that's going on so that we don't go and attach to anything. Whether it's external things or internal things, we try and prevent our mind from attaching to them. But in order to do that, we need to keep our minds here in this present moment to keep our mindfulness and wisdom here. And by doing this, we're developing right effort. It's not possible that if we just sit here and we just, just don't do anything, we just laze about, that wisdom will arise. It can't work that way. And just like if we don't go to work, then we don't get any money. These days we can see that in some places, if, if people don't go to work, then the government comes and gives the money. Or if they're ill or sick, then they'll get some, some benefit payments from the government. But the practice doesn't work like that. In order for us to give rise to wisdom within our hearts, we need to train the mind. This training of the mind, it relies on the effort that we put in and how sincere and intent we are in following the path of the Buddha. But if we follow it, then we'll come to know for ourselves the fruits of that path. At the beginning, it's natural for things to be very difficult. And some of us want very quick results, but it's hard for that to happen. And so we could refer to this as Dukkha Bhadibhata, the way of practice that's arduous. But when we continue with it and we give rise to effort frequently, then even though the going can be very slow, still we will experience happiness. These days it's difficult to practice in a quick way because the world is so fast and and that makes us kind of lazy in a way. We're used to getting things very easy. We're used to getting things very quickly. And so the amount of endurance and the amount of effort that we have in us can be very little. But if we stay close to a Kruba Ajahn, to a great teacher, someone who has great parami or uh, spiritual virtues, then even though we may not have so many ourselves, we, the practice can still go very fast because we're close to a wise being. Even though many of these great teachers have passed away, still their way of practice is around. 
And so if we follow that path of practice that they've laid down, it's like they're still here with us. And so it's possible if we sincerely follow that in line with their teaching, then a practice will go, will go fast. So we should do what we can to bring the mind to peace. And if that means that we use wisdom to give rise to peace and give rise to samadhi, then we should use that. We can contemplate into the, the unstable, the inconstant nature of all things, whether they're things internal or external, whether it's physicality, mentality, see how these things are not sure and do that frequently. When we do that, then we will be able to experience peace and we can succeed in this. We have what it takes to, to do this, to experience peace and to give rise to wisdom. We can all do that. It's not something that's outside of our range of abilities. If we just put an effort, then we can do it. Sometimes our mind will be very chaotic and frantic, going out all over the place. And sometimes there won't be very much wisdom there in the mind. And it's not the case that we'll be able to bring our minds into a state of samadhi every day. But we will know what that samadhi is like. We will know the benefits of that samadhi and we'll know that we're able to do it. So we carry on trying, even though we may be, uh, our minds may be very frantic and chaotic. We put an effort. And if they are very unsettled, then we can use chanting as a way to still them. So we can go over the chant, itipi so, and do that 108 times, recite that. If there are different disturbing emotions that are going on, if we're feeling annoyed or averse to something, we're feeling angry, we're feeling worried or unsettled, the mind is very scattered. It's not able to stay in one place. But if we just chant and chant and carry on with that, then the mind will come to a state of peace. Sometimes we have to fight with these moods and emotions. You know, if the mind's very scattered, then we have to put up a struggle. And we keep on with that effort until that scattered mind settles down. Another method that we can use to do that is to go over the meditation mantra, Buddha, until the mind reaches peace. When the mind is settled in a state of calm, then we contemplate the body. We can contemplate the bones of the body and, and see the body in that light. If the mind is still, then when we look through the bones of the body, then we'll see that they're not self. There's no me, there's no other there. If the mind is peaceful, then we'll be able to see things in one kind of way. We'll see things in one light. But if the mind isn't peaceful, then we'll see it in an entirely different way. And the mind will just run after all of its emotions. So we should use our faculty of wisdom to train our minds while we still have life and be intent in doing this for the rest of the time that we have in this world. So everyone, please be sincere in your efforts. And I ask for all of you to meet with success as well in this practice.